Global Governance Futures is brought to you from the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. How does the world hang together? What has gone wrong? And what has global governance got to do with it? To learn more, please visit ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. We don't tend to spend much time contemplating our own inevitable shuffling off this mortal coil. But as with the Buddha, our guest today, Professor Sheldon Solomon, argues that contemplating our own demise may not only be the Philip that we need to live life more fully, but that ignoring our unconscious death anxiety is now placing the planet and humanity in peril. Drawing upon the seminal work of Ernest Becker, Sheldon and colleagues argue that the fear of death is nothing less than the worm at the core of the human condition, unleashing powerful and often destructive forces in the world. Thomas Hobbes, the great political thinker, believed that the fear of violent death was the most irresistible, most reliable and most certain aid to compelling us into the arms of the protective Leviathan. In this conversation, we explore how this most primordial of instincts continues to inform our politics in the age of nuclear weapons, pandemics and climate change, as well as what us late moderns can do to alleviate our fear of death and perhaps escape our existential flatlands. Uh, Socrates said to philosophize is to learn how to die. So we've known since men at one. Uh, or even Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, when it gets right down to it, it's not the years in your life, it's the life in your years. This is Imperfect Utopias or Bust Global Governance Futures. Professor Sheldon Solomon is the Ross Professor for Interdisciplinary Studies at Skidmore College, New York. Professor Sheldon is a recognized pioneer in the fields of social and evolutionary psychology and has published widely on the effects of death denial on society, culture and human behavior. We spoke with him on the day of the US midterms, November 4th, 2022. I mean, this is actually a topic which is quite close to my heart. Uh, about five years ago, I had kind of a, a close encounter, if you will, with, with death, which kind of spun me into a, a deep inquiry into the topic. Um, I found myself getting heavily into Buddhism, the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. I also came across Ernest Becker's book, uh, the, the Denial of Death, and found that very helpful. And what really struck me was when I brought the topic up with friends, often I get one or two kind of responses. One would be, I've never really thought about it. The yeah. other response would often be, hmm, uh, you know, quite curt, like, I'm not afraid of death. You know, yeah, we live and then, then we're worm food. Uh, and neither response would inspire much conversation. And in fact, often if I tried to take it further, I'd kind of be accused of having a morbid curiosity. Um, so what I kind of took, took from some of those conversations is that people seem to be very comfortable with their, their death denial. So I guess where I want to start would be to ask, you know, why is the denial of death so, so pervasive, especially in Western culture, I guess? And how, how would you go about convincing a skeptic that, that death, riffing on the title of your book, really is the worm at the core of the human condition? Wow, uh, I, I, a remarkable question. I, I, to be silly, um, perhaps one of the most important questions that humanity now confronts, uh, because on the one hand, um, uh, I agree, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, given the work that I do, uh, you know, based on Ernest Becker's ideas in the denial of death and the research that we've done, you know, for several decades, um, I think uh, a very strong case can be made for Becker's central claim, which is that uh, one of the things that makes human beings distinctly and uniquely different from all other forms of life is that we're smart enough to know that we're here and, and consequently uh, equally uh, cognizant of the fact that, like all living things, our lives are of finite duration and that we too will someday die. And, and Becker's point w was that the unvarnished recognition of the reality of the human condition, I'm going to die, 
And I can literally be obliterated at any moment for reasons I could never anticipate or control, that that gives rise to potentially debilitating existential terror uh, that we as humans manage by uh, embedding ourselves into culturally constructed belief systems, Becker called them cultural worldviews, that give us a sense that life has meaning uh, and that we have value. And according to Becker, whether we're aware of it or not, almost everything that we do is based on an effort to manage death anxiety by maintaining confidence in our belief systems, uh, as well as a sense that we're persons of value within them. All right. So back to reality, uh, you know, I you walk around, and and I I also found these ideas, Tom, very compelling. When I bumped into them forty something years ago, um, I remember looking at the denial of death, where Becker's like, it is the central determinant of human behavior. And in my gut, I was like, damn, this guy's right. I, I've been disinclined to die since I was eight years old, and realized that it was going to happen. Well, uh, anyway, we we developed what we call terror management theory. We went all over Earth, uh, very excited about Becker's ideas. We don't think that you can explain anything about human behavior without recognizing the central role that death anxiety plays in almost everything that we do. All right, but this gets back to the, the reality, uh, which is that um, you talk to people uh, about these ideas, uh, and very often um, you get a very different reaction rather than, in my case, instigating an existential crisis that made me uh, leave my job for a year to reconsider everything uh, in light of these notions. Uh, a lot of people, just as you say, they're like, well, I never think about death, or uh, I'm not afraid of death, and therefore these ideas uh, must be wrong. Now, this doesn't help you win any debates, because what I generally say is, well, you don't think about death precisely because you're comfortably embedded in a cultural belief system that allows you to perceive yourself as a person of value in a world of meaning. And therefore, while you think that you're an anomaly that disproves these ideas, you're actually an ambulatory data point that is just an open advertisement for them. Psychological equanimity to stand up in the morning uh, without uh, debilitating distress uh, requires that we be comfortably situated in what is essentially a symbolic and ultimately illusory conception of the world. So that would be my short answer, at least to, to engage people. But like I say, that doesn't win any debates. That's like when Freud would say, oh, you're always interested in sex. You either agree with me, in which case I'm right, or you disagree with me, in which case you're repressing and I'm right. So am I right or am I right? So the to me, uh, that's not where we we can convince anyone. I think it's ultimately the research uh, for people who are willing uh, to consider it uh, that's most compelling, because there's now literally more than a thousand studies that show that death reminders, often very subtle ones, in, including just flashing the word death on a screen so fast that you don't even know that you've been exposed to it. Uh, have a, a, a really remarkable and potent effect on a wide range of attitudes uh, and behaviors. And so that would be what I would then try to shift the discussion to is remember Becker's point, uh, which uh, Freud made and annoys people, and that is that uh, you know not what you do. We are blithely unaware of what ultimately drives most of our behavior. And so, yeah, when someone says I'm not afraid of death, uh, I don't necessarily argue, but I do remind them of the Shakespeare methinks thou protest too much, because in our studies, 
the people who say that they're the least afraid of death often respond the most defensively when we ask them to think about themselves dying. So here's another instance with, with all due respect to people who are entitled to their own impressions of their own behavior. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we're quite uh, ignorant generally of what ultimately motivates us to do what we do. Yeah, so I understand when you sort of first pitched the theory in the 90s, it was met with a lot of skepticism by your uh, colleagues in the academy, psychologists. So I guess kind of speaks to the duality we often encounter in the academy, particularly in the scientific end between uh, the intellect and uh, affect or emotion. Um, so I guess it would be really interesting for you just to perhaps explain me, what do you think are perhaps the most compelling experiments that you've run? Just perhaps walk us through one that you feel really nailed. <laughs> yeah. Point. Well, okay. That, no, that's uh, actually a, a very fine point. When we started, uh, you know, we our original intention was not to do experiments. We just thought Becker's ideas were so compelling. And at the end of his book, Escape from Evil, he he said, you know, I I think everybody on Earth should be thinking about this. He wasn't saying I want to be rich and famous. Uh, he was like, no, it's not about that. It's the ideas that I believe need to be in, in public discourse. And he even mused at the end of the book. He's like, why aren't they talking about this at the United Nations? Shouldn't we all uh, be thinking about these things? And yeah, and I would agree with that. But most people didn't. We started talking about Becker and terror management theory uh, and uh, psychologists were distinctly unimpressed to the point where no one would publish any of our work until an editor of a journal just said, well, you guys are experimental psychologists. Why don't you come up with some proof? Uh, and then we're like, OK, um, we'll, we'll do that, even though these ideas are so potent that we believe they have merit. Uh, independent uh, of the scientific evidence, which is by no means unimportant, uh, but ultimately should be considered in the context of other ways uh, of knowing. Uh, be that as it may, we developed a very simple paradigm at first. We call it the mortality salience paradigm. Uh, and the idea is, is quite starkly simple. Becker says that our beliefs about reality uh, serve to minimize death anxiety. And, and so we said, well, OK, then let's remind people that they're going to die and, and let's see if they cling more tenaciously to their culturally constructed beliefs. And if they do, then when you're reminded that you're going to die, that should produce changes in both a positive and negative direction, depending on uh, whether or not people are doing things that either agree with or disagree with your own cherished belief systems. And so, uh, for example, we thought, OK, um, if you remind, let's say, Christian participants in a study uh, that they're going to die, well, they should like fellow Christians a lot more, and they should dislike Jewish people or anybody else who does not share their beliefs. And so that's precisely what we found in an early study that's been replicated dozens of times. When you're reminded that you're going to die, you like people who are like you a lot more, and you hate people and will even hurt them uh, if they're different. And, and, this is not only about attitudes. And when you're reminded that you're going to die, you, if you're German, you sit closer to people who are German and further away from people who look like Turkish immigrants. If you're uh, Iranian and you're reminded that you're going to die, uh, you're more supportive of suicide bombing and more willing to become one. I'm always joking about Americans being practical. We're not about to blow ourselves up, but we're happy to blow up other people. So when Americans are reminded they're going to die, uh, they're more eager to use nuclear and chemical weapons against countries uh, who do not uh, pose any direct harm. 
So that's one line of research that I've found very compelling because it helps us understand our seemingly congenital inability to get along with people who are different than ourselves. Uh, another finding that that I, I I really can't stop thinking about today um, is uh, November 8th. Well, I'm sure it's the same day on your end of the pond, but um, this is election day in the United States, the last day of democracy. I, I hope to be wrong, but we're on the cusp of fascism here. And if democracy falls in America, I believe it is the domino that will make the world tumble into the fascist abyss. And um, according to Ernest Becker, what underlies our tendency to embrace charismatic leaders from Hitler uh, to Donald Trump, I call him Orange Hitler, to any of the other uh, right-wing demagogues that are currently taking uh, over the planet and burning it down, by the way. If we had more time, uh, I would want us to talk about the connection between fascism and fire, and that uh, they are inextricably connected. Be that as it may, Ernest Becker said that the psychological allure uh, of our mindless commitment to ideological demagogues is to mitigate death anxiety. And sure enough, for the last 20 years, uh, we've done research in the United States in four different presidential elections where we show that in a benign state of mind, uh, people have very different political preferences than when you remind them they're going to die. So in 2004, in the United States, Americans liked Senator John Kerry a lot more than President George W. Bush in a control condition. But if we reminded them of their mortality first, uh, they like President Bush, who declared that he believed God had chosen him to rid the world of evil in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, they liked him a, a lot more. Fast forward to 2016, Americans liked Hillary Clinton a lot more than Donald Trump, unless you reminded them that they were going to die first. And then they liked Trump a lot more. Ditto in 2020. White Americans liked Joe Biden a whole lot more than Donald Trump uh, in a control condition. If you reminded them that they were going to die first, uh, they liked Trump a whole lot more than Biden. Well, here we are in the middle of a pandemic with the world uh, melting in an era of tremendous economic instability all of which are known to increase death anxiety. Uh, and a lot of people are like, oh, why are right-wing demagogues taking over uh, every place on earth? Uh, well, we would submit that this is in part a defensive reaction to just pervasive intimations of mortality that surround us every day. So I guess those are like two of the things that I find uh, most pronounced. And then on top of that, and I'll, I'll stop in a second, Tom, but it, the other thing that surprises us is, is that uh, Becker turns out to be right. At least he's not wrong yet. So when he says uh, that concerns about mortality have a pervasive effect uh, on human affairs, well, so far he's right. It's not only who do you hate and who do you vote for, uh, but uh, death reminders, they influence like what you wear, whether you put on uh, like uh, suntan lotion at the beach, uh, what kind of food you eat and drink, your attitudes uh, about animals, um, uh, the kind of stuff that we want to buy or not buy. And so I guess that's the other thing that surprises us a little bit. We started doing these experiments thinking, OK, let's see if the Becker dude uh, is overstating his case or not. Yeah, and so far, I would say not that everything that we have looked at has produced findings in accord with his claims about the central role of death in human affairs. Well, thanks, Sheldon. I think you've laid out an incredibly rich landscape of inquiry for us. 
Uh, yeah, and we definitely want to get onto the Anthropocene. But perhaps just before we do, uh, given my own interest in sort of foundational questions around politics, global politics, I was curious to ask, I mean, to what extent do you think we can also say that that um, the worm at the core of our politics is death anxiety? And I'm thinking of, say, Thomas Hobbes and the first political question that he asks, how do we ensure security, trust, uh, the conditions for social cooperation, because if we can't ensure that, then nothing else is possible. Everything depends upon that answering that um, uh, that foundational question. And I'd uh, be it'd be great to just get your thoughts on how how central do you see denial of death that death anxiety being to our political condition and hierarchies uh, in, through human evolution over over millennia. Yeah, wow. That's another, uh, uh, you know, well, again, to be silly, Tom, that's another one of these great questions. If I could answer it, we'd be celebrating, uh, you know, drinking rum out of coconuts on the beach with our Nobel Prizes. Um, I, I feel like this is another one of these, um, you know, on the on humanity's to do list. Um, you know what? What's it, it's it's a close call between fire and fascism because again, I see them as interconnected. Uh, and the uh, I'm I, I I'm cu- currently preoccupied um, with um, a guy named Eric Hoffer who wrote a book called The True Believer in 1951. You know, trying to understand the psychological underpinnings uh, of commitment to totalitarian and fascist leaders. And I guess the way that I've been thinking about it lately, um, Daniel Kahneman, a Princeton psychologist, won a Nobel Prize for his depiction of the human mind, you know, being basically two cognitive systems, what he calls a fast and slow thought. And he's like, look, most of us um, we'd like to think that we're thinking quite a bit, but in fact, we're mostly on a cognitive autopilot that uh, most of the day uh, we're kind of, as, as Kahneman put it, we're just driven by heuristics. You know, we have a view of the world and unless anything kind of arises that is radically at odds with that view, uh, we just kind of slide through the day uh, and, you know, kind of just live in our lives. Right? And then he says, look, and, and his point is, is that this uh, this uh, uh, this fast system of thought that's quite automatic, that's kind of the that's the default cognitive system. Uh, and uh, heuristically, it helps us manage because it gives us a comfortable sense of the world around us. Um, and uh, like all heuristics, uh, it is generally effective, but also prone to radical error. On the other hand, this slow system uh, of thinking uh, is more rational. Um, it is that which enables us to metaphorically and literally step back and reflect on ourselves and the world around us. Uh, and this is our gateway to reason and truth. And we are pretty good at it, even kids, but it takes time, it takes training, it takes education, it takes motivation and attention. Uh, And what what Hoffer said along before Kahneman, but now what contemporary people say, framed in terms of Kahneman's views, is that where we're at politically right now And this is not an indictment of human intelligence so much as bemoaning a lack of the development of our capacities. But most, at least in America and a lot of other uh, so-called democracies, we people lack um, the capacity to be responsible citizens uh, in a civil democratic society, Uh, because essentially what stress and uh, fascists do is they lobotomize their constituents so as to disable that slow thought system and thereby 
uh, have created a situation uh, where their followers become mindless adherents. And that's the death knell for democracy as well as human progress, by the way, because all creativity requires some access to that slow system of thought. So I guess that's kind of my view of where we currently stand, you know, and, and it is an ominous moment because what the Eric Hoffer dude said is, look, and this is in the 1950s. He's like, look, if you have two political parties and one of them is trying to appeal to reason where they're like, look, this is our view. These are our goals. These are the policies that we believe will help us address them. And then if you have another party uh, who just resorts uh, to screaming, emotionally charged slogans like build the wall, lock her up, uh, that are intended to bypass rational thought and, and to keep people enraged, um, and what Hoffer says is that's what demagogues are. They're alchemists of hate. They take fear and they turn it into hatred and they do so in a manner that prohibits any genuine cogitation. And that's where I see us right now in a death drenched environment of massive psychological dis ease. Uh, that has rendered uh, the, the average individual in most democratic societies incapable uh, of recognizing what's in their best interest and in and voting in accord with them. And so one just concrete example, and then I will shut up. So in, in the United States, um, the, we are again, I'm being silly, but not uh, this may be the last day of democracy. Uh, and the Republican Party, this is Donald Trump's party, they have said, look, if we get elected, we're going to eliminate Social Security uh, and health care for the average American. Well, these are two of the most popular uh, uh, programs in American history. Ninety percent of the people in America, they love Social Security. They love health care. Uh, but in a functional democracy, you would expect people to vote in accordance with their desires. Do you know, like the Abraham Maslow guy, the hierarchy of needs? Uh, well, where we're at now, and I love Maslow, but he's wrong because the high, it, it's, it's upside down. Uh, you know, Maslow says that, you know, we need to eat and then we need to have a place to live and then we need to have friends. But in America right now, People need to be white, and they'd rather be white than eat or have health care. And that has created a political situation where in our country today, uh, uh, 80 percent of Americans will vote in ways that are at odds uh, with that which they declare to be most important to them. And to me, that's the best indication that uh, we're in trouble in terms of the machinations that are supposed to underlie a political democracy. It reminds me of a, uh, a famous documentary by Adam Curtis, The Power of Nightmares, which I think is almost 20 years old now. Um, yes. We are really living in the time of yeah. uh, politics of fear, as you say. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm going to jump in now as the the young idealist that, that hears all of this doom, and I do probably agree with you that today could be a very dangerous and, and dark day for American democracy and American politics, and I guess the politics of the world at large. Um, you know, fingers crossed, five thirty eight is wrong, and, and we get a blue wave come Thursday, but we'll see. Um, no, no political endorsements here, obviously. Um, but so solution time, then. You know, if if we can recognize that we live in in times of insecurity where I don't know. I'm quite interested in maybe linking your ideas um, around pe people's self-esteem is not aligning with their material needs. I think is maybe that a, a, a some summary a summary of what you were saying that people are not voting according to their material needs. They're instead voting in in order to I don't know maintain some sense of self-esteem. I think that could be quite interesting. That's um, right. to explore. But 
what can we do as I don't know, not enlightened people because we're not the elect, and um, but but how can we make things better? How can we improve the world that we live in if we recognize or if we diagnose this is correctly the problem? Well, again, that's a, a, a fine point, Tom. Um, getting back to Becker, um, uh, his, his point was, I, I don't know how to proceed. So at the end of the Escape from Evil book, he said, look, I'm pessimistic, but I'm not cynical. And I, I thought and he uses a quote by Thomas Hardy at the beginning of the book of a way to the better there be. It comes from taking a close look at the worst. Uh, and he's like, look, I, I, uh, I, I wish I could be more cheerful, but uh, we may, in fact, be the first form of life to have the ignominious distinction of being responsible for our own extinction. Uh, and of course, that doesn't sound all that uh, optimistic. Uh, sounds like Nietzsche. Consciousness is the most calamitous stupidity by which we shall someday perish. And so what's the point? Well, Becker, in his most somber moments, he's like, wow, maybe self-conscious pieces of species meat wasn't such a good idea. Uh, you know, that uh, we as humans, we've not been here for a long time. We're a really short-lived species so far. And we may have been a really unfortunate and malignant detour that has uh, you know, really gummed up the so-called tree of life uh, and that, uh, you know, the only reason that we're still here is that we've just recently developed the technology to uh, allow us to reduce the earth to a smoldering heap. All right. So that's the bad news is that malignant manifestations, uh, death, anxiety, you know, they bring out the worst in us as I try and be humorous so I don't just collapse in tears when I talk about this stuff. I'm like, look, uh, you know, that it is our death anxiety or our refusal to acknowledge this explicitly, uh, you know, that turns us into depressed, hateful, warmongering, proto-fascist, plundering the planet. Uh, you know, in our alcohol, Facebook, Twittering stupor. Uh, and so that, all right, that's bad. But then we can turn that around. And I, I think it's important that we do. A and note that, okay, uh, that doesn't sound too good. On the other hand, we've got a good track record so far as human beings of at, at critical moments in human history, when we have figured out what's actually underlying our immediate difficulties, we've stepped up to the proverbial plate. Uh, my favorite example is just the plague in Europe in the Middle Ages, which had exterminated, uh, you know, over half of Europe. Uh, and we thought it was because of um, uh, evil spirits. Well, as long as we thought the plague was caused by evil spirits, people kept dying. On the other hand, when we step back and said, oh, wait a minute, it appears to be bacteria. Well, then that led to the development of penicillin and modern medicine and why we're here talking to each other today. All right, so by the same token, uh, the argument would be, well, you know, can, can we uh, collectively recognize the pervasively problematic effects uh, that, again, malignant manifestations of death anxiety cause, because if we can do that, maybe we could move in a more productive direction. Now, of course, the next question would be, okay, dude, stop talking. What do you mean? And, uh, and my point at that point, Tom, would be, well, what I mean is that time for the youth to step up uh, and um, to see where these ideas might lead. Because we see two directions. One is kind of the Albert Camus direction, come to terms with death. Thereafter, anything is possible. And so uh, one possibility that follows from all of this uh, is that, um, uh, is that uh, maybe it's time for the human race to grow up. Uh, we're still in diapers and behaving like we are. Uh, that. Uh, we, uh, I work with some uh, excellent folks, and they have coined the term existential maturity. That 
uh, we basically, uh, we lack the courage and frankly, faith in life to uh, accept the reality of the human condition. I like how Eric Erickson put it in his book, The Eight Stages of Man, although I wish he included the rest of the human race. In the last line of that book, Erickson says, look, when parents have the courage to die, their children will have the faith to live. And I, I love that. And I do think that um, there's some good evidence that that would be one direction. So, for example, Buddhist monks who spend their lives meditating in order to come to terms with their mortality, there's experiments that show that when they're reminded of their death, they don't behave in a defensive and unfortunate fashion. So that, that would be one possibility, noting that uh, every religion since day one, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the monks in the medieval Europe that worked with skulls on their desk, uh, philosophy, uh, Socrates said, to philosophize is to learn how to die. So we've known since minute one, uh, or even Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, when it gets right down to it, it's not the years in your life, it's the life in your years. And, and uh, at least as a vague abstraction, noting that there may be lots of ways to do this, I, I think that, that this is one direction. We are a brutally death-denying species, and Western culture is exponentially more death-denying than plenty of other cultures. And so uh, one thing would be to come to terms with death. Another would be to create cultural worldviews that make it more possible for the average individual to acquire and maintain genuine self-esteem. And so you mentioned this point earlier, Tom, about self-esteem, and I think it's an important one. Um, right now, uh, the Western world is a petri dish of psychopathology, I'm not trying to sound uh, cynical, uh, just pessimistic, uh, but uh, a third of the people in Western countries will be depressed at some point in their lives. 14 or 15 percent of Americans are depressed now. Another third of the people in America are addicted to drugs and alcohol. And as far as I can tell, the last third are in their sport utility vehicles driving as I speak to a giant shopping center to save a quarter on a lemon and a machine gun. In other words, um, this is a society characterized by massive and pervasive dis-ease, put a hyphen between dis and ease. And that so that raises the question, uh, and Becker addressed it in the 1970s. He said, look, whenever there's wholesale unhappiness, and by the way, this is 10 times the rate of depression uh, after World War II, uh, and so this is not, uh, this is a historical moment where, you know, we're psychologically shipwrecked. Uh, P and this was pre-COVID. And so now on top of that, we've got the dissociated stupor that we're all walking around in as a result of being isolated for a couple of years. So anyway, we've got uh, all of these difficulties. And what Becker said is you need to look uh, at the values of a culture at a particular moment and see if they're realistically attainable by the average individual. So you look at, I'll speak of what I know best, the United States. And so and we'll do it by gender. So if you're a male um, in the United States uh, and, um, you know, basically uh, what really counts is money and power. Uh, you know, to be silly, if your penis is larger than a phone pole, fine, maybe that'll get you some places. Uh, but generally, uh, you know, I, 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 you can be a midget. And you could look like you had a fire in your face and somebody put it out with an ice pick. No matter if you got a shit ton of money, uh, money talks and bullshit walks. All right now, we're also taught in our culture. It, it's a meritocracy. Um, and uh, and and basically. Oh, uh, the argument is that everyone has a chance. If you're, if you work hard, 
uh, you could be just as rich uh, as uh, Elon Musk or Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. And, and if you're middle aged and working in Taco Bell or whatever for minimum wage, well, that's your fault. Uh, and the the point is, is that um, that that's just simply not true, nor has it ever been. Uh, in the United States, there's almost no economic mobility. It's easier to get out of poverty in Bangladesh than it is uh, in America. And, and so here we are in a situation where we're taught if you aren't lazy or stupid, you could be rich. And if it's not, uh, it's your fault. And, and does it make sense why that's going to make the average American feel pretty miserable? In fact, it's even worse because in America, uh, we only value being the best at what you do. Uh, and I can't remember who wrote this book. It's uh, Michael Sandel, philosopher at Harvard called The Tyranny of Merit. But he's like, in America, if you're not the absolute best at what you do, then you're a loser. But think about that. That means that N minus one people in every social category are failures. And what Sandel pointed out is that in those cases, if you're not number one, you're going to be depressed or enraged. Uh, and uh, and just getting back to women for a moment, they have the same pressure. Uh, but on top of that, uh, you've got to be thinner than a piece of linguine because to be attractive in our culture requires that you be thinner than is physically possible to be. And you can't be more than in your mid 20s, after which you're just a fossil relic that should put yourself in a microwave on high for like 20 minutes. So you shrink into some desiccated fruit that we can hang on our windshields. In other words, my point, uh, and I'm overstating it, but I think it needs to be, is we live in a toxic world where we teach our children to adhere to unattainable standards. And it should not surprise us. Uh, the the psychic fallout that we're now witnessing. All right, so we got come to terms with death. We've got uh, construct cultural worldviews uh, that make it uh, more possible uh, for people to feel okay about themselves. So, for example, Becker in the denial of death, he says, "Look, I'm not trying to be naive or romantic." But he said, let's at least look at Christianity in the Middle Ages, uh, where in principle, you, you, you could be the pope, you can be the president, you could be a dipstick for a cesspool. It doesn't matter. Everyone was potentially eligible for immortality uh, if you did the right thing. That was at least the cultural system where everyone had a possibility of acquiring self-esteem. All right, so there's that. And then there's finally a, a, a boatload of recent work. And I think this may be the salvation for humanity that comes out of positive psychology. And it, it, it's about awe and humility and gratitude. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm currently preoccupied uh, with these notions because uh, I think that uh, they are ways to acquire existential fortitude that allow us to sidestep uh, the biggest danger of self-esteem. Uh, and that's, as Virginia Woolf put it back in the day, that you make yourself look big by making other people look small. So sometimes self-esteem is good for us, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily good for the folks around us. Right, well, Back to awe and humility and gratitude. Well, there's a big body of work now uh, coming out of different places in the world. Uh, and this gets back to, uh, again, all of the world's great religions talk about the sense of awe uh, that is engendered uh, by our basic uh, humanity. Uh, Emile Durkheim, dead French sociologist, he called it collective effervescence, that at our best, if you'll pardon the profanity, it's just fucking great to be alive. It's just like awesome. And all of us, I think, have had that tremendous feeling 
it doesn't, you don't need to win a Nobel Prize. You don't need to have billions of pounds or dollars. There are just some times uh, where uh, you are explicitly aware of and joyously engaged with the spontaneous exuberance of life itself, that which can never be reduced to words. And, and when we're in that state of mind, it is awesome to be alive. Uh, well, that does two things. It, it eliminates defensive reactions to death reminders in experiments. And it also creates humility, which is, I know I'm being silly, but you have to ask Americans to look that up because to be humble in America uh, is seen as a character flaw because we only want to be big, 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 big. But humble does not mean self-deprecating. Rather, what it means is that we have a realistic sense uh, of where we stand in the cosmos, which is that we are relatively inconsequential specks of respiring carbon-based dust put here in a time and place not of our choosing for a short amount of time uh, before we will summarily depart and then defer to the next round uh, of living things. Uh, well, the, the fact is, is that for some, like Russian novelists, uh, that creates misery and nihilism, right? I'm a little speck in an unfathomably large universe. But for people who are odd and the humility that results, that's uplifting to note that you're this tiny speck in the, this extraordinarily large cosmos, but that you're still connected to all that is. Uh, well, that turns out to be tremendously reassuring psychodynamically uh, because humility also uh, uh, makes people less defensive in response to death reminders. And that leads to gratitude. Uh, and, uh, and this is kind of my big thing these days, not that it's about me, but I'm like, look, here we are. We're kind of first world people. Uh, things are rocky in the world, but uh, we're not in Pakistan, you know, where a third of the country was underwater and 30 million people lost their homes. Any of us that slept in a bed last night or had breakfast today, um, we should be extraordinarily grateful. Uh, and uh, and there is, again, a massive literature just reflecting on anything that we're grateful for takes the edge uh, of death anxiety. And at this point, my view would be uh, th that uh, any of these directions or all of them uh, should be uh, really uh, high priorities in terms of moving forward. I meant to ask you guys, I don't know if this is going to show up, but this I just read this book called The Ministry of the Future. Have you ever heard of this? I, I never have, but it's a science fiction novel written a year or two ago. But what I find amazing about it um, is here's a guy saying we're fucked. Things are going to be really bad. Uh, and yet, just like I was saying earlier, uh, this is not necessarily grounds for despair so much as grounds uh, for reasoned optimism uh, based on our sense that at our best, we are quite capable uh, of reflection uh, and resilient adaptation. Uh, but I don't know that the, this Kim Stanley Robinson, the author of the book, I don't know that he's familiar with any of these ideas, uh, and yet this book oozes uh, with suggestions along these lines. We are going to have to stop being so arrogant. Uh, we are going to have to develop cultural world views that are not based, as is our world right now, uh, on the assumption that only infinite growth uh, is the direction that we ought be going in. 
Uh, and I don't mean this to be a political diatribe, but it, it turns out to be true. And that is that, you know, we are at a choice point the way that I see it. Uh, we can either nurture or sustain a capital based economy. And that will be the end of earth as habitable for humans. Or uh, we can recognize that we need a rather radical reconfiguration of most of our basic institutions uh, such that the goal is not to maximize an abstraction, that being money, uh, but rather uh, to in a in a, a relatively harmonious and balanced way. Uh, address basic human needs. To put that another way, you can't eat money, although right now you can't eat without it. Uh, but we live in a world right now where our, our economic system will fall apart in hours if people only bought what they needed and wanted. It is a system, as Marx pointed out, he was a shitty economist, but he was a great psychologist, um, that uh, there's that we're on it's a Ponzi scheme of sorts. Uh, life is great and we've all benefited from it, uh, but it is a system that requires continuous and exponential growth. And there's only two things in the world where exponential growth is good, malignant tumors and compound interest. So uh, I do think we've got some um, uh, 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 we've got some challenges ahead. Uh, but I don't think that we're congenitally incapable uh, of addressing them. And maybe perhaps not surprisingly, I, I do see the recognition of the role of death anxiety uh, in all of these matters to be necessary, but by no means sufficient. And uh, just to be very clear, I, I you know, I, we've been doing this work for a long time. And people are like, look, you guys are simpletons. There's surely uh, there are other factors that influence human affairs than death anxiety. Uh, and our response is, yes, of course, we've never claimed otherwise. Uh, what we're saying is these ideas are necessary while not sufficient. If, if we use these ideas, we're going to need more. But if you think you can explain human behavior in any meaningful way while ignoring the role of primarily unconscious death anxiety, then I think you're in a state of denial, which might make you feel momentarily better, but ultimately does the planet and humanity a tremendous disservice. Well, I'd, I'd like to push you a bit on, on one point, Sheldon. Uh, You've written that it's impossible. It's impossible for cultural worldviews, whether they're religious or they're secular Western, to eliminate their anxiety. And I, I think that perhaps could be quite controversial for some in the audience. You know, is death anxiety really unescapable? I mean, in the West, I think we'd probably draw on, say, the Epicureans, right? That, uh, you know, while we exist, death isn't here. Um, and when we're dead, well, we're not going to be present to to experience that. So why why would we fear death? But you know, I think telling ourselves that, well, um, you know, thinking that we're going to die, similar to like two plus two equals four, there's not much consolation there. But riffing a bit on the point you made earlier about you know hope uh, for the future, I was wondering whether there's other ways in here to escape kind of the existential flatlands of death anxiety. And I was thinking of say Viktor Frankl. A kind of this, a kind of hope without optimism, which is the title of a very profound work by Terry Eagleton, which I read recently. It was a great Terry, book, yeah, yeah, powerful book. And Terry basically makes the case that you know Viktor Frankl counselled the victims in the concentration camps that they shouldn't lose hope, that they should keep their courage in the certainty of their hopelessness of their struggle. In the certainty, sorry, that the hopelessness of our struggle does not detract from its dignity and value. So the point that they seem to be making here is, or the to formulate it as a question, is it possible to make a gift of our death, your death, for those who come after us? So that something fruitful at least comes from our failure, if you will. As we yeah, uh, uh, tragic times, right, on the horizon here. Ooh, I, I like that point, Tom. I think that's uh, brilliant. 
Um, now, I'm going to sound hypocritical because my buddies Tom and Jeff are not here. So we write these books together. Uh, and um, it almost our book was five years late and it almost took another five years because we agree about very little. And we wanted to have an annotated uh, 300 more pages about every sentence that we disagreed about. Um, I'm a lot, I, I, I favor your view, which is that it is an overstatement to claim that death anxiety uh, is so pervasive that it is impossible uh, to eliminate or at least reduce to the point where it's relatively inconsequential. Uh, and I, I am hopeful. I, I think uh, you got Victor Frankl, uh, you know, and, and Two of my favorite people, Frankel and Emmanuel Levinas. Have you heard of him? He's a philosopher who was also um, in a concentration camp. And, and then, of course, there's Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, and I find it uh, interesting and uplifting that the most optimistic take on human aspirations come from people uh, that were literally uh, in concentration camps and so you've got frankel uh you know who's like under even under the most egregious circumstances is the possibility for meaning and hence um the uh, a call for hope and courage uh you got sartre saying i don't care how many chains you've got on me you can chain my body but you can't chain my mind and then you've got Levinas, who I don't pretend to fully understand yet. He's French and he's a philosopher. But uh, 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 but it, he talks about how even in the most abjectly miserable circumstances, that there is some basic biological affinity for merely being alive. Uh, and he argues that even when that is metaphorically uh, you know, like a dim candle almost on the verge of being blown out or, you know, or, or the little flame of loving life uh, is about to be exterminated by an onslaught of negativity. He's like, no, I think the bottom line is that ultimately our love of life will prevail over our fear of death. And I, I, I do. I find that um, I, I hope it's not uh, just an existential anxiety buffer, because I, uh, uh, rather than, uh, you know, really for me, that that's the well, that's what gets me up and smiling <laughs> in, in the morning. And I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that coming from those quarters, the, the you know, the people in the most difficult physical straits having ultimately, arguably, the most optimistic take on the human condition. I think that is grounds for optimism. I also wanted to pick you up on um, Eric Hoffer's work, which I, I did come across briefly in, in some of the, the prep I was doing for this interview. Uh, I mean, he's got a pretty pessimistic view on charismatic users, right? Yeah. Uh, perhaps more pessimistic than Max Weber. Uh, I mean, maybe not. Uh, he simply says that they're rarely exceptional, intelligent, noble, yeah. or rational. But I, I'd just like to push a little bit on this word intelligent. Um, you know, what's the difference between intelligence and wisdom? Yeah. And so we are life. moving into an age of, say, massive economic meltdown, climate refugees. It strikes me that we're going to need some kind of what we might call tragic or even more, more accurately post-tragic leadership. We're going yeah. to wisdom. Um, and no, that's um, interesting to us, Sheldon, you know, how, how do we in our culture confuse wisdom with intelligence or knowledge? Uh, and where do you go for wisdom in our culture? Wow. 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 All, now you asked like 10 great questions, Tom. So the, um, so the evolutionary psychologists these days, they make, a distinction between uh, two kinds of intelligence, a and one is is just based on raw power and cunning, and is an extrapolation of primate dominance hierarchies. Right. So in chimps, it's who can beat the shit out of who, a and authority 
and respect for it it is basically deference to a dominance hierarchy. And in humans, uh, that can be in the form, uh, that would be Hoffer's uh, mindless adherence uh, to ideological demagogues that uh, and it's based uh, on fear uh, rather than admiration and respect. Then there's another kind uh, of intelligence that is based on wisdom. And, and it turns out that even kids, uh, they can't talk about it, but they differentiate between I'm going to follow you because I'm afraid or I'm going to follow you because you appear to know what you're doing. And, and basically, um, and that maps on, in my view, to the Kahneman, two kinds of systems of thought. And we know, and there's research that shows that historically, uh, when there's massive upheaval and insecurity, we tend to favor leaders who are based on domination and fear more than wisdom and expertise. Uh, and so that, that we're in a, the, so the, we're capable of, of both kinds of cogitation. Um, but yeah, so that's the way that uh, I would define it. I think intelligence is an unfortunate word because uh, someone who is cunning, um, uh, you can be you could be both kinds of intelligent. Uh, but for example, and I don't mean this to be political, but it's fairly well known that that Donald Trump is an idiot. His professors in college said that. This is not, he, uh, you know, I have my own opinion and he is a moron, but, the, but this is actually a statement of fact. He won't reduce, he won't release his grades because we know they're crappy. Uh, his professor at the University of Pennsylvania died 30 years ago and said he was the, uh, the, the dumbest student that he had ever seen. But his followers, they don't see it as such. They see him uh, as the all-encompassing repository of truth and beauty. Uh, but that's a lobotomized deference to authority that has nothing to do with real intelligence. Uh, and real intelligence, in my mind, would be based on a deference uh, as a result of awe and respect in response to actual expertise rather than a fear drenched submission uh to somebody you know kind of metaphorically beaten on their chest yeah i mean i feel like we kind of skirted around uh, the issue of religion maybe we won't get into it today but i know you've you know you've certainly done some work on, in that area and perhaps what we require is some kind of a, a new religion absolutely uh, when it comes to wisdom for me and and death denial uh uh, I, I've I've been very influenced by Stephen Jenkinson, who Me basically too. asks the question that Camus poses, which is, "What is it to be a human?" And Stephen basically says, "The dilemma is trying to live the realization that what the world requires of us is that we accept our humanity." That's right. What has to die is our refusal to die, our refusal for things to end. Um, I find that quite powerful although I, I am still sort of finding my way into what that really means in an embodied lived sense yeah i would agree with that and uh, again uh, it's another thing i don't know if the the kim stanley robinson in this ministry of the for the future book if he's aware of jenkinson's work but it doesn't matter because he's channeling the same ideas um he also talks about uh, you know that humans are humans uh, and we are fundamentally religious creatures if we take that term uh, in its broadest sense, remembering that the word religion comes from a Latin word that means to bind. Uh, and uh, uh, religion evolved long before gods as, uh, as the ultimate means of jointly celebrating our humanity in a manner uh, that fosters social cohesion and social coordination, um, uh, and, and, you know, and on those grounds, I'm with Becker, who argues that any viable belief system will have religious connotations, whether we recognize them as theistic or not. 
Okay, and so I, I think I, I jump in here, and oh. I mean, I have, you've said so many interesting things, and and a lot of uh, what you've said has resonated with me, or at least makes me think of various Frankfurt School thinkers from the past in in Germany. So someone like Siegfried Krakauer, for example, with his essay "Those Who Wait," it's basically entirely about those that find themselves without a meta narrative for their lives and don't really know what to do with it, and and are left not really knowing what to do with their newly found Gewurfenheit, to borrow the Heidegger term of you've been thrown into the world and you look around you and you have to make sense of it all. And I agree with you that I think the best way to approach that is with radical optimism, gratitude. You, you take a look at the mountains and the ocean and the forests around you and you realize how lucky you are to be alive. And really the best way to approach this is, is with joy and rapture rather than you know fear and, and sadness. Um, yeah. But I mean, I was going to ask just as a young person thing, and, and we say things like, you know, YOLO and then do something stupid or, you know, I'm here to have a good time, not a long time, and then just kind of follow our base instincts. So I guess what I'd ask is uh, a reflection or advice from, from you towards the younger generation who find themselves, I guess, potentially in, you know, reading their Camus or their Sartre, finding their existential angst and not really knowing where to turn or what to do. Um, you know, what, what's your advice for us? I mean, my advice to be silly, Tom, is uh, they should be listening to you. And actually, uh, I should be shutting up and you should be talking more. Uh, because I think just, you know, you just mentioned Heidegger. Uh, and, um, you know, anyway, this it's not about me, but I wish I had read him 40 years ago. He, he, the fact that he was a Nazi made me. Uh, disinclined and Nazis are people too. I'm being a little silly, but, but Heidegger's description of what it would be like to live authentically, uh, I find very captivating. And you just summarized it because he's like, look, uh, to live authentically, uh, you know, you have to do two things. You have to come to terms with death. You know, we already talked about that. And then you have to accept what he called existential guilt, which is not about a moral transgression so much as realizing that on the one hand, uh, you're culturally and historically contingent, right? You're born in a body that you didn't choose in a time and place that you didn't choose. And yet, um, as Sartre points out, you're still condemned to choose. So Heidegger's like, look, you have to make choices. You have to accept responsibility for those choices, even though they're quite limited. All right. And so then Heidegger says, well, all right, let's say that you've come to terms with death and you accept responsibility um, for uh, your choices. I, I like in uh, the denial of death, Becker quotes the poet Rilke, uh, who just talked about the guilt of unlived life. And I love that. And young people I love that when I was young and my students love that now. It's like, we got to, what do we need to do to live? Uh, well, we've got to get ourselves in that position. And so, but then Heidegger says, well, okay, so, so what? Let's say you do that. Uh, uh, the world's not going to look much different and you might not even feel like much has changed. And this is Tom, uh, old Tom, this is Buddhist. I'm, I'm more and more drifting in that direction because um, Heidegger says, look, uh, you, it, things, uh, uh, Buddha said enlightenment is quite ordinary. A and yet Heidegger and Buddha is like, yeah, and yet everything's different. A and Heidegger, he says, look, he has three terms. Uh, one's called anticipatory resoluteness. He's like, when you're living authentically, First of all, you're anticipating, which means you're looking forward. And if you're looking forward, it's to something. Back to Aristotle, there's intentionality. And to be resolute, because uh, I grew up in America, I had to look that word up. That means to, to live with admirable purpose and determination. So I love that anticipatory resoluteness, which he says leads to solicitous regard to other things and other people, had to look that up also. Solicitous means that you just care in the best possible way. So you're not a narcissistic sociopath like most Americans. I'm looking forward to life. I care about other people, not just other people. I care about other things, living things and inanimate things. 
And then my favorite line, Heidegger says, and when that happens, life appears to be an ongoing adventure perfused with unshakable joy. And I'm like, dude, then this is not Mary Poppins. This is like an existential philosopher pointing out, he's like, this is not going to obliterate suffering. This is not going to uh, reduce anxiety to the point of it disappearing. Rather, what this will do is to give you the courage and the fortitude and the hope and the faith and the goodness of life uh, that you will be able to engage in the reality of the human condition, which does involve uh, suffering and dis-ease um, in a way uh, that uh, allows us to uh, the, express the, the the best potentialities that reside within all of us, and so I, I'm, I'm I, I, that would be um, my thing uh, about well, where to proceed, uh, and um, it would be to encourage folks of your generation, Tom, uh, to dabble in these ideas. And by the way, and I, I mean this quite sincerely, I'm delighted that I'm speaking to you now uh, as kind of a, an incipient fossil on the cusp of oblivion. And I hope that these ideas are compelling, but to be most compelling, it's going to be uh, you folks, the, the, the young Tom and uh, your cohort of humans. And what I mean by that is here you are engaged in what I think are the most important ideas uh, uh, for anyone interested in humanity. But you're young, uh, you're steeped in 21st century technology. I, I like that we wrote a book, but that's where I teach at Skidmore. The only people that read it are the ones that have insomnia. Um, the, the the children of today have the attention span of gerbils and they're functionally illiterate. And while I wish that that weren't the case, uh, it is still true that the best way to disseminate these ideas and to foster engagement with them uh, are the 21st century technologies that um, you all are proficient in. Uh, and um, engaged with, which is just kind of my way of saying that. I, I hope if people listen to what we've done today, uh, that they find it to be of interest, uh, even though that may not uh, be for us to judge. I, I, I've enjoyed our conversation. I actually think that somebody listening in uh, might get a lot of it, uh, much more so than one of our technical uh, manuscripts, uh, let's say. So anyway, that that would be my view is that I'm very optimistic, actually. Um, I'm, I'm like, young people, you have to step up uh, and we have to actually step aside. Um, and uh, I would say these ideas can be a, a good bridge to future opportunities of which I am generally blithely unaware by virtue of uh, my status as a uh, rapidly approaching former human. <laughs> well, I, hope, I hope it's not too rapid. <laughs> well, Sheldon, uh, yeah, I guess as I, I guess I belong to the Spanish generation, so I'm doing my 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 best to serve as some kind of transmission belt, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. I'm relying on my younger co-hosts to get get the word out there, and that's yeah. What this is all about so thank you so much for, for joining us for what was a really i think powerful provocative and and hopefully kind of inspiring conversation i i guess the takeaway is that we really should be getting out there together and enjoying it while we still can yeah no there you go no I, I, so anyway yes i i besides that this was uh, an awesome experience i'd like to think that there's some downstream effects and this is just a random thought, but I do think it's important. You know, I, 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 I love exchanging ideas with people and I really um, am, um, I am mortified, though, when we measure the success of these kinds of ventures by how many people might be listening to us. So, you know, you do a podcast and you're like, oh, 
whatever. There's a hundred thousand people that listened. So that was great. And then you do another one and there were 12 people that listened and you're like, what an abject failure. Um, I take respectful issue with that claim. That's not for us to judge. There could have been a hundred thousand people listening and they're all out now, you know, trying to buy chicken wings for the next football game. On the other hand, in the podcast where there was 12 people listening, how do we know that we don't have the next Gandhi or, or Churchill or, or fill in the blank uh, who was just about to jump off a bridge, but they heard our podcast. They're like, wow, what a cool idea. I'm going to try living. So I, I, I have great hope for the value of these kinds of enterprises, you know, not to go all Henry David Thoreau, but it's like throwing a pebble in Walden Pond. There's going to be rippling effects that we may never notice, but that doesn't undermine the possibility that something of enduring significance has happened today. And I'm always optimistic on those grounds. Yeah, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, just getting some of the comments and actually sort of the direct emails from our audience, uh, it's incredibly just humbling, really. I mean, people are listening, and sometimes it's clearly really striking a chord. No, that's awesome. Also humbling, and this is, of course, me being silly, is I forgot there might have been people listening. I thought we were <laughs> we were just talking. <laughs> so for folks that are out there, this is awesome. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if anybody's inclined, I'm easy to locate on the internet. Feel free to um, email me. And I hope maybe this is not the last time that we get to exchange ideas. I must say, Tom, the program that you are at and represent, uh, it just could not be more timely or important. And um, I'm supposed to do some teaching at Oxford next summer. And if you folks are around, I'd love to come meet you directly. That would be amazing, Sheldon. Uh, open invitation at, at UCL. Definitely keep me posted, please. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Excellent. All right. Yeah. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. If you liked this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, other resources, listen to past shows, and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance.